So I come to you from East Carolina Neurology across the street and have met quite a few, few of you on rounds. I was asked to do this lecture last year and the hurricane came and messed up everybody's schedule. So I've tried to update it a little bit um, and nobody's heard it before, so that's helpful. Um, this is not something we deal with that much in the inpatient setting, although we do occasionally have our problem headache patients on the inpatient service. So this is geared primarily to your outpatient clinic. Um, as you've heard all through medical school and residency, history is key, and I don't think it comes any more true until you get to headache. And you pound these people for details, it takes a long time to do a good thorough headache history, but you can usually get your answer from the history. Um, one point in this lecture I'm going to try and cover over is when do you take a picture of their head? When do you order a CT? When do you order an MRI scan? Because um, not everybody needs one. And we'll go over some of the common headache presentations and then outline some basic treatments for, or some basic guidelines for treatment. So your primary headache types, these are your garden variety headaches and usually do not, I repeat, do not require imaging. So your migraine headaches, your cluster headaches, and your tension headaches. Tension and migraine are going to be the primary headaches you're going to see in the outpatient setting. Most of your patients, that's what they're going to have. A uh, cluster doesn't come around too often, but it is a little different. It's very important to recognize. It often gets misrecognized in the ER and pretty easy to treat if you recognize it. Um, facial pains kind of get a division of the monks themselves. The biggest ones are your trigeminal neuralgia, which again is very, very often missed in the emergency room. I'm not saying anything against the ER docs. It's because trying to get the history is hard and patients are in so much pain, <coughs> you can't get the right history a lot of times. And occipital neuralgia is a common one, often kind of missed, but it kind of gets mixed in with migraine for some folks. But it is in your, your guideline for your um, boards. So secondary headaches, these are the ones that usually need imaging. Your sinus headaches, temporal arteritis, low pressure headaches, carotid dissection, central venous thrombosis, subarachnoid hemorrhage, subdural hemorrhage, hypertensive headaches, meningitis, and traction or tumor headaches. So not all of these need imaging, but these are headaches that are due to an underlying cause. So that's why they're considered secondary headaches, and so you have to treat the underlying cause and not just cover up the pain. So what are your red flags for secondary headaches? I always learned the first, worst, cursed, and 51st method of remembering these. First, because it's the first headache of a person's life. Worst, it's the worst headache of their life. Cursed, it's got something abnormal about it. So whether you've got a weak arm or a weak leg or slurred speech or difficulty speaking. And 51st, a person does not present with migraine headaches or tension headaches over the age of 50, usually. So if they're presenting over 50, you better think about something else. Um, there's been some more recent publications that like the mnemonic SNOOP, S for systemic signs or symptoms, N for neurological signs or symptoms, O for onset, usually whether it's a thunderclap headache, and O for old age, meaning over 50, although that age we like to move farther and farther the older we get and then progression of an existing headache disorder. So if you have a person who's had migraines since they were 16 and they suddenly have 40, have changed their character, we better start looking for something else because no longer is it your garden variety migraine usually. So pick whichever one you like to learn better and remember those are the ones that need to get imaging. Um, with the history, it's important to talk to the patients about location. Migraines are usually on one side or the other. They can be both. If a patient has never had a migraine on the other side of their head and has always been on one side, that's somebody you need to think about imaging. Severity, um, mild headaches, moderate headaches, severe headaches. We don't think much of it, but it actually helps patients classify what they need to treat, what they don't need to treat. Insurance companies are starting to look a little more detailed into the severity of headaches. I treat a lot of headache patients with Botox, and until I put that word severe in there, the insurance company isn't going to cover it. Duration, how long are their headaches lasting? Big difference between a headache that lasts five minutes and five hours. Exacerbating headaches, what makes it worse? What makes it better? Um, what medications they've already tried? Very important to go through every single over-the-counter medicine they've tried, every single um, prescription medicine they've tried. Patients do not like to tell you about their over-the-counter medications. I don't know how many patients I come in and they're taking <coughs> ibuprofen, eight tablets a day, six Excedrin a day, five Tylenol a day, and they come in and they tell your staff when they walk in, oh, I don't take anything. 
you got to find out what they're taking over the counter because a lot of times that's the reason they have a headache. Family history is important. Most migraine patients have family members with migraine. Um, and the physical exam is important for your secondary headaches. So that's where you're looking for your cursed or for your systemic or for your neurological signs. So I tried to put this together with a little cases. We'll see how they work. The first one's a 25-year-old female, left-sided stabbing facial pain <coughs> for three weeks. It comes, it goes. It takes her breath away. She cannot work. She cannot function with it. She's been in and out of the ER three times. They've given her shots of pain medicines. Nothing helps. Head CT is normal and exam is normal. What are people's thoughts about what this could be? Trigeminal Tri neurology is a good thought. <coughs> Cluster is a thought, yep. Anybody else? Oral arthritis. TMJ is a thought. Um, I had put this together to be an example of trigeminal <coughs> neuralgia, since you guys have had some other good thoughts. Cluster headache is going to be a little different because it's usually not brief. Cluster patients, cluster headaches tend to be about an hour in duration. Um, so that's a little different from the trigeminal neuralgia, but some trigeminal neuralgia patients will change from that brief stabbing pain to a more constant pain. So they do start to blend. Um, the I don't see too, I don't work too much with the, the oral arthritis folks, but TMJ is an important thing to think about with your patients. I heard that mentioned by somebody. Unfortunately in Greenville, we don't have too many dentists that focus on TMJ. And if the real issue is TMJ, there's some really good <coughs> specialists in Raleigh that will do some injections and um, focus on the TMJ a little more. So this was put together as a trigeminal neuralgia patient because of the paroxysms of pain. So they come and go. And some of these patients, I mean, they're a snap second of pain. The pain has to be intense, and that's where that severity comes in. A mild facial pain is not trigeminal neuralgia. Um, often in these patients, you can precipitate, you can bring out the pain. So on my exams, I tend to tap them in front of the ear, and you can get lancinating pain tapping them in the ear. Another thing you can do is take a piece of paper or a fan and blow on their face, and if that brings out the pain, that's very suggestive of trigeminal neuralgia. Your patients will come in and say, I can't sleep at night because the ceiling fan makes my face hurt. And that's often indicative of trigeminal neuralgia. Some patients cannot brush their teeth or eat because that, that anything touching their teeth will bring out that pain. Um, patients are different um, with trigeminal neuralgia, so you have to take and kind of think of it all together. But that's what the attacks are stereotyped for that patient. So you aren't going to have a patient who the breeze bothers them one day and then brushing their teeth bothers them another day. It's going to be the same thing that triggers it every single day. And there's got to be nothing else wrong with these patients. And um, you, these are um, actually the cephalgia IHS criteria for headaches that are listed here. These are not going to be things that are on your boards, and unfortunately they do not correlate to ICD-9 codes, but these are the standards of how headaches are defined by the society that thinks about headaches. Um, how do we treat these patients? The number one treatment for trigeminal neuralgia is probably thought to be carbamazepine or oxcarbazepine, um, which is your tegretol and your trileptal. Some patients cannot tolerate the carbamazepine. They get too lightheaded, too dizzy, too nauseated, so start your doses low and bring them up slowly. The nice thing about these meds is you can follow levels to look for toxicity. Gabapentin can be very effective for some of these patients. Both Oxcarbazepine, carbazepine, and gabapentin are a little difficult for patients to take because they have to be taken three times a day. Um, your carbamazepine and oxcarbazepine are available in extended release meds, but I usually start these patients on the short-acting meds to get yourself to a dose that they can tolerate. Phenytoin is helpful in some patients. Lamotrigine, baclofen, clonazepam. The tricyclics are very helpful, so your nortriptyline, <coughs> amitriptyline, and protriptyline and then valproic acid. So a lot of your seizure medicines work in, in these patients. <coughs> Most patients with trigeminal neuralgia will get better. About 50% of them after six months, they don't have the pain, you can start to titrate their medications off. Unfortunately, a third of them do not respond to medications. You run these guys through every single medication and they don't work. Um, these folks are good candidates for surgical options. They can either do radiofrequency ablation or there actually are some microvascular surgical techniques can be done 
and Gamba knife is helpful in these patients too. I think the surgeons here will work on them and then there's also a good facial pain center in Raleigh that will treat these patients. Um, if a patient is young and female, you have to think about multiple sclerosis. We think about multiple sclerosis as a central nervous system disorder. Um, a percentage, I think it's about, oh, I don't remember my numbers actually, but a percentage of patients who are young women presenting with trigeminal neuralgia have MS. So it is, in these patients it is often worthwhile to go ahead and image them to look for MS. So you want to with and without contrast MRI. You also want to look for a mass or a tumor around the trigeminal nerve. I don't image everybody, particularly if they respond well to meds initially, I won't take pictures of them. But if you have something weird about it, definitely image them. <coughs> Questions on trigeminal neuralgia? No. Case two, a 30-year-old man stabbing pain behind the right eye. It wakes him up at night. It lasts an hour or two. His right eye gets red. His nose runs. He's tried Tylenol, ibuprofen, etc. and hasn't helped. No family history headache. Cost or headache, good. So the autonomic nervous system signs are very helpful in these patients. Sometimes they'll sweat on that side. Sometimes their eye runs. Sometimes it's just their nose gets congested. Sorry, I lied. Don't worry, it's for after. Some nursing home doesn't want to take my patient. <laughs> um, so the criteria for cluster headaches, they have to have had five attacks. You usually can't diagnose cluster with one. They have to be severe or very severe. They're always on one side. These are usually side locked. So the patient who gets cluster on the left side, it's always going to be on the left side. It's rarely, rarely, rarely going to switch sides. Um, the pain lasts between 15 minutes and three hours. The headache it has to be accompanied by greater than or equal to one of the following. The um, conjunctival injection or lacrimation, nasal congestion, the eyelid can swell. Some people get sweating on the forehead or the face. Sometimes you will see a pupil asymmetry or a drop of the lid. And people who get cluster headaches are very restless when they get their headaches. You will hear that they pace around the room. Patients hit themselves on the head, stab themselves on the head with these headaches. They'll pound their head on the floor. These are called suicide headaches for a reason. The pain is very severe and people do commit suicide because of untreated cluster headaches. Um, headaches can either happen once a day, they tend to happen in the nighttime, some patients will have up to eight attacks a day, um, and these cannot be contributed to any other disorder either. How do you treat headaches? Oxygen. Easy, easy. Not a pill. We usually recommend 10 to 15 liters per minute with a non-rebreather mask um, for about 10 to 15 minutes for these headaches. So usually you can prescribe oxygen, they can get a tank delivered to their house, they get a headache, slap the oxygen on, and it takes care of their headache has to be the big tanks because you can burn through a little tank very, very quickly. Um, Imitrex or Sumatriptan is very helpful for these headaches. Um, the shot is best because it acts so quickly. Um, the pills, it's going to take half an hour, 45 minutes. The headache's well on its way by then. Um, most insurance companies will approve more than the standard of injectable Sumatriptan if you put cluster as the diagnosis because they know that the patients have more than six and they're going to need a bigger supply. Um, most cluster patients tend to fill the prescription even when they're not having their cluster. They're called clusters because most patients will have them every single night for three to four weeks, then they'll go away. Some patients will have that happen every three months, sometimes every year. Others, it will become a more continuous pattern. Your DHE or dihydrogotamine is helpful. These patients usually need to be taught how to give it to themselves IM because they're not going to be going to the emergency room every time they get a headache. Um, and then your Zomatriptan, which is Zomig, the nasal spray is helpful for patients. Um, ergotamine is the medication I've never used for, for these patients, but it is helpful. And then I like to use intranasal lidocaine. It's, you can get a viscous lidocaine solution. They get in about a 100 cc bottle if you give them a syringe without a needle and have them take about two to three cc's and slowly squirt it up into the affected nostril. It deadens the nerve roots over there and quiets down the headaches. And for some patients that's helpful, particularly if they're having them so frequently that they're running out of Imitrex injections. Dr. Yes. Verapamil is a preventative medicine. So 
the key to treating cluster is verapamil. You got to prevent these things. So when you've got a patient that has a cluster cycle that's established, if you know it's going to happen every spring, you can get the verapamil started before they start. If you got something that comes in in the middle of a cluster, you got to treat that headache, but you got to know there's another one coming. And so you need to put them on their preventative medicine. Verapamil, actually, it's on this side. Verapamil is probably your better preventative medication. So most patients get tried on this. Um, lithium is usually your second step. There are some others listed here, but lithium's good. Lithium's approved for two things. What two things do we treat lithium with? Lithium for. What do we use lithium for? Bipolar and cluster headaches. Um, and so if the patients fail valproic acid, I tend to put them on lithium. I'm sorry if they fail verapamil, I put them on lithium. There is some data support Depakote. Um, I've never used methylcircnonavine. I think you actually have to get it in Canada. Um, Topamax can help some patients. And there are some studies that show you can desensitize people with histamine. I personally don't know how to do it, um, but it has been shown to work. But when they come into the ER or come into your office with cluster, it's good to get them on their prevention and give them something um, to treat the individual headaches with. Usually when they come in, they've had clusters for a couple days or weeks, and it's helpful if you also give them something to help transition them to that preventative, and that's where prednisone comes in. So usually if you give them a prednisone dose pack, and, so you give them three meds, something to take for the headache, the prednisone for a week, and then start the verapamil at the same time. And that prednisone helps cover them while the verapamil takes effect. Um, ergotamine and DHE can also be helpful for these patients for that middle of the road period. Other questions on cluster? Yes. No, it's very good for migraine and um, uh, your uh, post drinking headaches. <laughs> If you, if you ever got a hangover and you're in the ER, throw on some oxygen, it works pretty well. I don't know exactly what the mechanism is, um, but it works. Other questions on cluster? No, I'm failing on the mechanisms of actions today. Uh, case three, we got a 19-year-old female. <coughs> she gets this horrible throbbing pain in her left side. It happens about once a week. Bright lights bother her, loud sounds bother her, smells bother her, she gets sick to her stomach, she throws up, she's taking Tylenol, BCs. Don't forget to ask about your BCs and goodies. <laughs> People forget that those are medicines. Ibuprofen and Excedrin don't help. Her mom and dad don't get headaches, migraines, but they used to get sick headaches. What are these? This is a very classic presentation of migraines. These are probably too simple for cases. For some reason, migraines used to be called sick headaches and so when your patients have sick headaches they're migraines they just mean they're throwing up and usually they're migraines um, but they'll tell you they didn't have migraines you cannot di diagnose officially migraines until a person's had five headaches usually last between four and 72 hours if you're in family medicine or peds headaches in kids are a little different and so some of their headaches migraine headaches are much shorter in pediatrics but in adults they tend to be four hours or more um, they are usually unilateral, but these are the important ones. You have to make sure they flip sides at least once. They're usually pulsating. They're moderate or severe. Mild headaches are not migraines. Um, and they're usually aggravated by activity. So you usually ask them, does it hurt worse if you're running down the street or if you're climbing stairs? You feel every step as you take it. Those are usually migraine patients. Um, they need to have either no or nausea and or vomiting and then photophobia and phonophobia. Um, migraines are thought, they used to be thought to be due to a vascular mechanism. We really think now it's more of a neurochemical mechanism. Uh, we think that there's hyperexcitability of, in the central brainstem it, that then activates a vasodilation as well as an inflammatory process. Much of the migraine literature now is saying that we need to treat migraines with both tryptans and anti-inflammatories due to the inflammatory mechanism that's going on. Um, as this pain cascade starts, patients will tell you their hair hurts, their skin itches. It's probably some of the reason why they get tingling in their face or the tingling in their arms at times with these headaches. Because as the cycle gets revved up, it activates more and more of the central nervous system. There are a lot of tryptans out on the market. 
One of the basic things I learned in residency to help with treatment of these headaches is they come in two forms. We got our short forms, we got our long forms. You have patients who have migraines that are four hours, then you've got patients that have them that last two and three days. Your Imitrex is not going to help a patient whose headache lasts two days because Imitrex only has a half-life that's about four hours, and then it's gone and the headache comes back. So your short half-life tryptans, which are good for your standard golden garden variety migraines, are Zomig, Relpex, Axert, Imitrex, and Maxalt. Those are your short half-life ones. Your longer half-lifes are the Trexamet, Emerge, and Frova. Um, you don't hear a lot about Emerge and Frova, but they are very good medications. They have half-life 8 to 12 hours. Emerge has gone generic now, which makes it nice because right now the only generic meds are Sumatriptan, which is Imitrex, and Emerge, which is Neurotriptan. Treximet gets its long half-life by being combined with naproxen. Um, that is a branded medication. <coughs> in practice, you can take Imitrex and naproxen and use them together, and it works just about as good, although you'll have patients that tell you they don't. Um, other treatments, DHE, very good in the ER setting. We don't use very much of it in the ER. Um, don't know why, but it works well. It's great in-house. Um, I don't think we have an actual set protocol at the hospital. We probably should. Um, to dose DHE, you need to pre-treat with Reglan or another anti-emetic of your choice because this is a very nauseating medication. Treat with Reglan and half an hour later start with 0.5 milligrams of DHE. If the patient tolerates it, you can go up to a milligram and then it's a milligram every eight hours. There are some arguments as to how many doses you can give a patient. Most people would say dose for three days and then, or until the headache goes away. I usually dose till the headache goes away, but you max it out somewhere between eight and 11 doses. This is not a medicine you're gonna give for a week. Um, NSAIDs, pick your poison. Doesn't matter which NSAID. Some people respond differently to them. I am Toradol is wonderful. Um, and then um, those are very helpful around the clock. PR set, Dolgic Plus, that's your butalbital, Tylenol, and caffeine. I'm probably going to be struck by lightning for mentioning it as a treatment. There's a lot of argument amongst headache specialists as to whether these should be taken off the market. Um, caffeine and butalbital have a lot of addictive properties to them. Patients tend to overuse these medications. You need to give very explicit directions when giving these patients these medications because if they're using them every single day, their headaches are going to get worse, they're going to get addicted. You can have withdrawal from not having them. They can be dangerous with your Fioraset. Um, they work, so some of us still use them. Uh, you can use them in your cardiac patients, so some of us still use them. Try and avoid narcotics. Um, this is another point of contention amongst your headache specialists. A lot of times we do use IV narcotics in the hospital when nothing else works. You've got to get the pain under control. Um, they are good for rescue medications in the outpatient setting if you limit the supply. Patients should not be using narcotics more than two days a week. Some people would argue they should never use them, but that sometimes you're stuck and you got to use something, so we just need to know where our limits are. Um, questions on migraine treatment? Yes? How the ED occasionally will use droperidol? Droperidol is great. There's a lot of literature that says droperidol is very helpful for migraines. Yeah? What about Maxolfate? Mag sulfate is awesome. So I'm a big proponent of magnesium sulfate. Um, two grams IV is good in the ER, it's good in your inpatient. We use it in the outpatient setting. Um, I will, it, there is also data that it works as a preventative medication. So depending on what you have, we've got, uh, I've got another couple slides on prevention, uh, but you can dose magnesium for prevention as well. I don't think it works as well to stop a headache if they're on it for prevention. Um, but magnesium is thought to kind of stabilize the neural membranes and helps with migraines. On the note of, oops, I forgot I had this on here too. Um, some of the details, do you guys have access to the slides? I thought you did. Yes, no? I haven't printed them out, okay. Um, what I did in the yellow is highlight what the dose is supposed to be for an adult. Um, I have been getting some notes from, from outpatients family medicine, internal medicine, folks around here, that'll start a patient on Imitrex 25 milligrams. That's a pediatric dose of Imitrex. Your standard dose is probably 100. I will agree that if less works, go ahead and do for it. So if you want to start them on 50, 
and if one tablet doesn't work, they can go up to two. Once you find out 100 is what they have to take every time though, give them the 100 milligrams because they're only going to get nine of these a month and if they're having to use two every time they take them, they're going to find other things to take because they're going to save their Imitrex. And really we need to teach patients to take medicine as soon as the headache starts because as soon as this process gets started, we need to stop it. If we don't, the mechanism gets out of control and the headaches become much harder to control and they end up in the emergency room. Um, so usually you need the head for the 100 milligram Imitrex, the, um, the 5 milligram Zomig, the 10 milligram Rel or, um, Max Alts, 12 milligram Axerts. Just go to the biggest dose. Don't play around with the little baby doses because those are usually for teenagers and kids. Um, the 25 milligrams is actually for your little kids. Um, preventative medicines. I only put the ones that have, I think, strength A and B de evidence when we look at this evidence-based medicine thing. There are a lot of preventative medicines that have been tried out there. These are FDA approved, except for the butter burr. These are FDA approved for preventative me prevention of migraine. There are just the five of them. Amitriptyline, Depakote, Propranolol, Timolol, and Topamate. I will tell you, I don't use amitriptyline. I use nortriptyline, but everybody's got to get comfortable with the medicine they like. They're, they're similar, but the amitriptyline is the one that's FDA approved. This one shows up on board questions for neurologists. I don't know if it shows up on board questions for medicine. I, that's been a while. Um, Hmm? Pregnant patient, you do not want to use amitriptyline on. You do not want to use Depakote on. You do not want to use Topamax on. Propranolol is okay in the pregnant patient. Um, it's listed, I still think, as category C in your pharmacopoeia, um, but it's probably the number one one if you're going to have to use a prevention in a pregnant patient. Butter Burr has just gotten the nod from the American Academy of Neurology for Prevention of Migraine. It is an herb. Um, patients can grow it in their backyard. Please tell them not to. <laughs> if they grow it in their backyard, there is a um, toxic substance that comes with it that can kill you. So it's best to buy this stuff that says PA free because they've taken the PAs out, which is the word about this song. Um, and the PAs are what will kill you. Um, you can buy it at the vitamin shop or something like that. It's usually, you have to go for about 150 milligrams a day. Usually treat patients for about three months and then have to take a break from butter burr. So not one of the ones that's gotten the FDA approval, but it is out there and it does help. Um, the last one down there is Botox and it has been approved for chronic migraine. You have to be clear in your notes that they have over 15 days a month of headaches lasting <coughs> over four hours with photophobia, phonophobia, and nausea and vomiting. It's a series of 31 injections across the forehead, over the ears, and the back of the head, and the shoulders. And it decreases headache frequency. It doesn't take them all away. It's yet another preventative medicine, but it can be very helpful for headaches. Um, these patients need to really be counseled on lifestyle changes because that often factors into migraine headaches as well as tension headaches. Sleep's important. They need to eat regularly. We find a lot of patients, if they skip meals, they'll get migraines. They can control that, um, but they need to be told they need to control it. Exercise has been shown to help with migraine headaches. They need to drink water and limit their caffeine. Um, stress reduction can be very helpful in migraine patients. It's just hard to get them to do it. Um, the easy stuff is the hardest, right? So the patients that come in with a migraine that won't break, is, those are patients with status migranosis. This is where the Reglan and DHE combination is very helpful. Um, there's some data that IV push of Depakote will help. This is not an IV infusion of Depakote like you get for seizures. This is 500 milligrams over <coughs> 7 to 15 minutes, much faster than you would do for seizures. Um, I haven't found it to be that effective. We use it on occasion. Um, but it's something to kind of pull out if you're at a loss, if you're at a loss, especially if you're in the ER. Um, Toradol around the clock is very helpful with these patients. This is where the magnesium comes in. We use it a lot for status. Prednisone is helpful, either IV or oral. Um, orphenadrin is Norflex. It's a um, muscle relaxant. Unfortunately, it is not on formulary at this hospital, um, but it is helpful in status. Um, so what is a chronic 
daily headache. Your patient comes in and says, I have a chronic headache. Chronic daily headache, you really need to get them, take a very good history. You gotta back them up, find out how the headache started. Was this a tension headache? Was this a migraine headache? There's actually something in the headache literature called new persistent daily headache. That's a completely different beast. New persistent daily headache patients, they can tell you the exact time, date, and situation that their headache started and they have had a headache ever since that day and time. And they are very, very difficult patients to treat. Um, most chronic daily headache patients, though, used to be episodic migraines. There are people who would have a migraine eh, once a month, then it became once a week, then twice a week, then three times a week. They kept eating their ibuprofen, Fioracet, and Tylenol, never saw a doctor, and now they have a headache every single day. Um, you have to start just chopping away these patients, get them to help with lifestyle changes, get them on preventative medicine, rotate their abortive medications and kind of reduce the number of attacks they have and sometimes can get them under control. <coughs> if people are under treating their headaches, so they just take a medicine to dull the pain, they're not stopping that whole cycle that's going on in the brain and the headaches <coughs> continue to smolder and continue. You need, patients need to treat their headaches quickly and they need to get complete relief of their pain else they will develop into chronic daily headache patients. Um, the diagnosis for chronic migraine now, or the criteria for chronic migraine, greater than 15 headache days a month and they have to be greater than four hours each. Um, as I talked already, head trauma, neck trauma can trigger people to turn over, overusing medications can turn them from episodic to chronic and then not under-treated headaches can cause that transition too. What's a medication overuse headache? It actually is a whole different criteria. Tension headache patients and migraine headache patients can develop medication overuse. Um, people without a headache history can develop medication overuse headaches. Um, patients have greater than 15 headaches a month and they use abortive medications more than 10 days out of the month and they've been doing it for more than three months. Almost anything can cause a medication overuse headaches. Your biggest offenders are your opiates, your Fioracets, your Excedrin, Triptans can do it, and that's another reason, luckily, the insurance agencies kind of limit your access to triptans. It helps keep these patients from turning into chronic daily headaches. If your patient is burning through their entire prescription of a triptan, you need to put them on prevention. Basically, if a person's having more than one to two headaches a week, you need to put them on prevention. Um, if it's a simple analgesic like ibuprofen or Tylenol, they really have to have been taking them more than 15 days out of the month. It takes a little longer to develop that. <coughs> if you have a patient using a lot of over-the-counter meds or a lot of triptans, you need to give them something to quiet the process down to try and break up that headache. DHE can help. Some patients will, or some specialists will say, treat them with a triptan every single day to break that, which kind of goes against the not taking it every single day. But if you keep it for a defined period of time, it can break an overuse headache. Magnesium again crops up here. It's very helpful for breaking those headaches. You can do oral stuff, give them a Depakote bridge or magnesium bridge or Toradol bridge and that can help transition them over. <clears throat> I didn't put a case in here for tension type headaches, but to, for the criteria for tension headaches, they are, they usually last 30 minutes, but they can be long headaches and there they get confused with migraines sometimes. Usually they're bilateral. They're mild to moderate, and therein is the big difference between migraine and tension. These are mild to moderate headaches. These are not aggravated by activity. So these are, these are what a lot of people consider their garden variety regular headache is an episodic tension headache. Um, you should not have nausea or vomiting, but you can have loss of appetite with tension headaches. It's a little different. And you should not have both photophobia and phonophobia with tension headaches. And this is where headache really gets, or headache history gets important, because if you're really trying to dice out in some of these patients, which is it, you have to go back to these strict criteria. Um, Anti-inflammatories are the number one best medicine for tension type headaches. Everything on here except for tramadol is an, and the butabatol campaigns is an anti-inflammatory. Um, so pick your anti-inflammatory or like and learn it, love it, use that. When you have a patient that doesn't respond to that, we have to go find a different one. Um, patients who have tension headaches need to be advised though that if they're having tension headaches more than two to three days a week, you need to put them on a preventative medicine or they need to look at their lifestyle and see what they can change to help manage their headaches. 
Prevention for preventative medicines for tension type headaches are not as good as those for migraine headaches. So it's lifestyle changes are even more important in your tension headache patients. Stress management, they need to learn to identify their triggers. Um, there are there is evidence for EMG biofeedback training in these patients where they have EMG leads on their forehead and they can watch their muscle activity and learn to reduce that. Unfortunately not available in Greenville. There used to be a lady in Raleigh that did it but um, she only treats veterans. If you got a veteran that needs tension feedback, we got a good lady that does it. Psychotherapy is very helpful in these patients, it's just hard to get them to do it. Acupuncture, there's some evidence for, um, and physical therapy can help some of them. There are some preventative medicines out there. There's not as much data behind them. The most likely ones to work are going to be your tricyclics, and then um, venlafaxine is very helpful. Mm. There's a lot on this list. Some of them are anti-inflammatories. Gabapentin is helpful. Basically, people have tried everything. It works for some people, so you can give it a try. Um, but amateur or the tricyclists and venlafaxine probably have the most data, and that's why they're on the top of these two lists. So, case number four. We got a 65-year-old guy. Eh, we got a daily headache. It hurts. It's more than mild. It's all over. It gets better later in the day. Tylenol helps a little bit. His left hand is just a little bit weak. Do you image this guy? Yes, we got two reasons to image him. He's over, well three. He's got a new headache over 50, he's over 50, and he has some left-handed weakness. Um, also, one thing from the history is that as the day goes on, the headaches gets better. Um, this is a patient who has a tumor in his head. Um, when people are lying <coughs> down, there's increased pressure, the headaches are a little worse, they stand up, that pressure goes down, the headache gets a little better. So if you've got somebody with morning headaches, you got to start thinking about tumor. You also have to think about things like sleep apnea and not sleeping well, um, but tumor is something to consider. Um, so these patients need to get images taken. If there's a tumor up there, you got to look for a, a, a primary. Um, many times this is a metastasis. And we don't like to biopsy the brain if we can get away with it. Um, but so if there's something easier to access, we'll biopsy that. So basically, history is key. Um, know your red flags. Know when to image. Insurance companies do not like it when you image everybody with headaches, and they will not pay for them. Um, train your patients to treat them early. They got to treat them strong. Don't mess around with 200 milligrams of ibuprofen. Go for the 800, 600 to 800 in these patients. Um, preventative medicines are very important. There's a lot of talk about the fact that we do not put enough migraine patients on preventative medications. One in five people have migraines, and probably 30% of people who should be on preventative medicine are not or more. Those, that equals to a lot of lost work days, a lot of ER visits, and a lot of cost. Um, so know your preventative medicines and use them and start them early. Um, and it's very important to, to have people help to look at their own lifestyles and teach them what they need to look at to try and prevent migraines and do what they can to prevent their migraines.